This was a tax collector, not the most popular guy on the block. He was somebody that had, had hired himself out to Rome to collect taxes, and they were known, first of all, that, that alone made them you know, not very welcome in their neighborhoods, but they took advantage of that oftentimes to cheat people. Rome didn't care what the tax collectors did as long as they got theirs. Well, the tax collectors said they don't know what the ta real taxes are. I can tell them anything, and they'll just have to pay. And the Roman soldiers will back me up. Well, so you, you just had a bad situation. If you were a tax collector, you were not popular. And, of course, this guy was not exactly a giant either, was he? I mean, physically, he had a problem. He was interested in hearing about Jesus and seeing him. But, Jesus, but you know, Jesus drew crowds wherever he went, and small people have problems in crowds. And so, uh, you know, every Sunday school child knows what he did. What kind of a tree did he climb up in? Sycamore, yeah. Well, it was a sycamore tree along the side of the road there, and so he climbed up on the branches to look down. Well, you know, think about Jesus and just, well, these, the, the crowds are here. This is wonderful. I get to talk to crowds and, and, and deal with them and give them the word of God. Jesus didn't do that, did he? He stopped under that tree. I have... You, can you imagine what Zacchaeus must have been thinking? Here I am trying to be inconspicuous. I just want to see. I don't want anybody to pay attention to me. Everybody hates me. But Jesus, and really the Father, knew all about Zacchaeus, knew what he was, and loved him. And Jesus didn't look up at the tree and say, Hey, anybody up there? Come on down, join the party. No, he said, Zacchaeus. You come down. I'm going to spend, spend today at your house. And salvation came to that house because Jesus called him by name. Oh, I'll tell you, he wants to call everybody that he calls in his kingdom by name. And there has to come a time when he's, his heart just reaches out to you. But you look at the heart of God and, and other, other stories, other accounts, because these are not just stories. These are things that happened when Jesus went through Samaria to a people who were despised. To the Gentiles, they were too Jewish. To the Jews, they were too Gentile. They just kind of didn't, have, didn't fit. They had a corrupted version of Judaism that they followed, so they understood some of the, some of the Old Testament teachings, but they had their own place of worship in Samaria. And so Jesus went to a place where no, no self-respecting Jew would go to start with. And on top of that, the person that God had sent him there to meet was somebody that didn't even have the respect of her own people. So she was an outcast all the way around. This was a messed up lady whose lusts controlled her life. It just led her into one dead-end relationship after another. But Jesus was, God in Jesus was interested in that woman that day specifically. And he went and he communicated with her. And she didn't understand it. But oh, when the day was over, she went running into the village and began to share what this one that had met her, this one that had taken a personal interest in her. I'll tell you, God is so great and yet he's interested. His heart is so great that he can take an interest in anybody with any kind of background. I don't care who you are. You know, our nature, apart from God awakening us to his reality, our nature is exactly like Adam. We just don't, we aren't comfortable, to say the least, with the idea of God coming to have anything to do with us. We feel dirty. We feel unworthy. We feel like, well, and of course the devil will tell you he's going to hem you up. He's going to make your life miserable. He's going to put you on a straight, narrow religious path, and, and you're going to, you know, stifle your life. You're going to miss out. Thousand and one lies the devil tells people to keep them from opening their hearts to his voice. Uh, there's so many places you could go. Let's just go to John chapter 5 for a moment. Look at a few scriptures where Jesus talks about this in particular. Of course, as long as we think of God's voice as the way Adam did, as something to be afraid of, something to shun, something to run and hide from, you know, we'll miss out. 
But oh, I'll tell you, I believe there's people here this morning who could tell you there was a time when you ran and there was a time when you said yes. Are you sorry? Are you sorry? Did, you, did he mess your life up? Did he just ruin your life because you said yes to him? Oh, I'll tell you what. You have no idea what he has in store for us. Uh, in verse 19, that's a good place to pick it up. Jesus said, I tell you the truth, the son can do nothing by himself. So there was the utter dependence of the Lord Jesus on his father. He can only do or do only what he sees his father doing. Because what Ever the Father does, the Son also does. Boy, would that God would bring us to that place where what we do is really Him in us doing it. Now, I realize we're, we're growing, we're learning, God's teaching us His ways, but I pray that God will work in me. I pray that He will work in every one of us so that what we do is really Him in us. We can have all the doctrines, we can have everything all straight and dot every I and cross every T. I got that right that time. And, uh, and still not have anything, not accomplish anything. Because it isn't any of those things, it's Jesus in us. As it was the Father in Jesus. But he says, for the Father loves the Son, shows him all he does. Yes, to your amazement, he will show him even greater things than these. For just as the Father, now this was a, on the heels of a miracle is what he's talking about. Just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the Son gives life to whom he is pleased to give it. Well, that tells me we're dependent on him, doesn't it? But I'm so glad for his nature of love and mercy that does not look upon you and say, this one is worthy of my attention. It rather is almost the opposite. It's the folks that think they're worthy that are the least likely for God to have anything to do with. It's the ones that know they need him. That he reaches out to and he reaches out with a heart of compassion and says, I know what you are, but I love you. I want to give you life. Just, I just read that, just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so, the Son gives life to whom he is pleased to give it. Moreover, the Father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. I tell you the truth, whoever hears my word, and believes him who sent me has eternal life. 